For more than four decades, Jim Eichner has been a part of WKNO and a part of our lives. A man of character and personality, an inspiration, a colleague, a friend. Join us as we spend a moment remembering Jim Eichner. I'd say that Jim is probably the most recognizable person when it comes to an association with WKNO. Wherever you went, you always met someone that knew Jim. They knew him through his local theater, and knew through his rotary work or his other service work, or through Ottawa Church. And it was hard to go someplace, you know, on the way in, we had to stop because somebody had to say hey to Jim, and then while you're eating, somebody's going to come up to the table. And before you leave, he's got to say a, a personal word to the people passing, and you know, once you've, he just built up such a, a community. I think it was only natural that he would wind up on TV because it was in his blood. Whether it was here at WKNO or on the stage or at the Rotary Club, he was a natural. Jim Eichner, he was an amazing man. He'll be missed by more people than he could possibly ever imagine. Jim Eichner was a Memphis original a multi-talented, multi-faceted dynamo who tried his very best to live life to the fullest. He had character, he played characters, and he was a character. As his hair turned white, he began to dress like your classic Southern gentleman, but he was fully a man of the 21st century, excited about change and creativity and youth, always wanting to know what was coming up next. That was our Jim, a man of the world who traveled everywhere from the historic streets of Europe to the new horizons of Sao Paulo. But he went home most nights to a house about a mile down the road from the house he grew up in. That reminds me of the old song, Orange, You Glad You're You, because <laughs> I am glad I'm me, and especially that I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. I love this city and have for, for a few years now. He was a true Memphian. Um, by the description of the word, uh, not just did he love the place, but he knew it. He knew it seemed all of the people in it, and everybody knew Jim. Just off Lamar in Midtown, uh, it, I was born on a street called Oakview. It was December of 1933 when Memphis first met the little blue-eyed tyke who would become the city's great friend for 82 amazing years. Uh, my family, my father's family, uh, all opened up Clarence Saunders Piggly Wiggly stores all over the country. Then we came back to Memphis, oh. and then I went to Messick High School, uh, well, from the sixth grade on. Messick High School on South Greer, between Spotswood and Carnes, was the school at the heart of a bustling neighborhood in the early 1950s. There were about 200 of us in that class, and Jim was very, very prominent. He was into everything. My happiest memories always were of our assembly programs when I would see Jim and Collins Kilburn do skits and laugh and laugh and laugh. They were the cutest things. They were so much fun. And he was very social and he was very accepting of any group. He, he made you feel like you were intimately his friend. He was very accomplished all through high school. In fact, I mean, he won all kinds of awards uh, in speech. That's where I met the individual who had the greatest effect on my professional career. Well, it was Freda Kenner, who was the most marvelous speech teacher the world has ever known. She was honored nationally. Jim was her favorite. When she was 100 years old, and she lived another three or four years, when she was 100 years old, she asked Jim to do the eulogy at her funeral. And Jim said, of course, Miss Kenner, I will be delighted to do uh, the eulogy at your funeral. And she says, oh, I'm so happy. Something like, I can hardly wait. <laughs> Graduating in 1952, in high spirits and high hopes, a young James Eichner set out to fulfill his destiny as a big man on campus. We both went to UT Knoxville for a while and uh, I saw him on campus there. Being a cheerleader and acting and, and on the debate team and the like, everything in the world except studying. My folks thought maybe I needed a more cloistered atmosphere and so I went to Southwestern. Too many extracurriculars and not enough study. I could see how that could happen. The lesson learned was that plans don't always unfold as expected. 
and that personality and charm don't stand for much without a solid foundation to hold them up. And he found that and more back in Memphis at Southwestern Presbyterian. When we think of Jim Eichner on this campus, class of 1957, a flood of happy memories come to mind. A story of uh, being inspired by great professors, uh, by being uh, uh, challenged and championed by uh, wonderful classmates, and of course the story of his courtship and, uh, and with the love of his life, Margaret Ann. After college and marriage, Jim joined the Army and began a brief but fascinating career. I took my basic training at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, and then I went to intelligence, the Army Intelligence School at Fort Holabird and became a counterintelligence agent for Department of Army. Wow. The thing that made that appeal to me after being in boot camp, uh, after having slogged around in 100 degree temperature with a rifle on my back, was that they said, well, if you become a counterintelligence agent, you wear civilian clothes, you drive a civilian car, and you become an investigator. And I said, what do I have to do? They said, well, you have to extend for an extra year. And I said, book it. So I did and uh, got out of intelligence school and uh, was sent to Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York was the setting for the first year of Jim and Margaret Ann's life together. And our first home was on Niagara Falls Boulevard. We, we had a honeymoon home our first year. As he wound up his stint in the Army, Jim had his future to think about. And that future brought him back south they would let you have an early out if you wanted to get out and start school. So I got out three months early, so I only had to go nine months of that year, actually, That's... and then went to the University of Tennessee to law school. While studying for the legal profession, Jim sought out a job to help pay the bills. Serendipity led him into the world of radio broadcasting. Jumping Jim with mayhem in the AM. Well, I started. <laughs> I started radio, there was a fellow by the name of Wayne Hudson who hired me. He lives in Memphis. He came to Memphis and became the head of Plow Broadcasting here. He was a marvelous guy. Mar he, he just gave me a, a huge break. He had asked me if I'd had experience with the board. That is, those, those twirly the things that you do. You, you've heard, you've seen that. Volume knobs. You know what I'm talking about, the volume knobs. <laughs> the twirly thing. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with the board mostly by observation. And. <laughs> He said, well, okay, I'll give you an audition. And so he gave me, I said, I like your voice. And then I began all manner of terrible, terrible things on radio. Yeah, in some ways, Jim was a classic radio man. I mean, with Jim, you know, he was, I think he was a born showman. I think he, he always did that. But having that sort of experience talking to an audience, you know, and, and it is, I mean, it is a performance. And I think that that influenced all the performing that he did. After Jim completed his law degree and passed the bar, he and Margaret Ann returned to Memphis. Despite his best intentions to settle down for a career in the law, Jim had a hard time saying no to show business. I had gotten out of law school and was with the district attorney's office. I was prosecuting. I in was Memphis? working, yes, working for Phil Canale. Okay. And Wayne called me one day and he said, I really am having some trouble. I got one jock that I had to fire. I have another disc jockey that, I, you know, has, has a wife that's about to go into surgery. And I mean, he, he, this litany of unfortunate things. I mean, lemons, you talk about, he, he, he had his lemons going. And he said, I need somebody on the weekends. I need somebody bad. Well, Wayne, I'm with the district attorney's office now, you know. I said, I'm not just one of these jocks flying around the streets here. Uh, I'll, I'll check and see because I really did owe him the world. He, he managed to pull me through for, to get through law school. So I went to, to Phil Canale and I said, uh, General, I, 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 they called the attorney general, they always called him General. I said, General, uh, I have a, an unusual request. And I told him, and he said, I never had a DA, DJ before. And I said, well, maybe it's time for one. He said, well, I guess, is it, could you use another name? I said, that's no problem. Of course, I can use a nom de air, you know, right. I, I can use a name. So I used my middle name, Edward, Jim Edwards. Even when he'd finally given up his Jim Edwards persona and his radio career, Jim was drawn to the excitement of the music industry. Steve Cropper had just left uh, Stax and, and started a studio over on uh, uh, Poplar Avenue. And uh, so uh, he and Jerry Williams started a studio, TMI Studios, Trans Maximus Studios, and asked if I would come full time uh, as their general counsel. And I did and had a marvelous time uh, doing it for the three years that I, I did. Jim's energy inspired those around him, including this former young neighbor who looked up to the cool young lawyer next door who gave him a ride to camp and talked to him like a grown-up. And here I am, you know, a junior in high school, and, and, and Jim is telling me all about uh, 
uh, going through law school and, and, and his interest in, in broadcasting and, and uh, uh, just to listen to the story. It didn't matter the topic. It was so uh, interesting and it really just grabbed me. And, and to this day, uh, I'm 58 years old and I remember, I remember that day like it was yesterday. And as a lawyer, I always wish that I, I could really just tap in a little bit of what Jim was, was eating. While this born showman was leading a conventional nine to five existence and being a good husband and father, his inner spark was most stirred by a special volunteer project. The, what I had done was direct the gridiron show, the Memphis gridiron show. Uh -huh. uh, Burl Oswanger and I directed the gridiron show, making fun of politicians, poking, you know. We would fill the Rivermont, we would fill the auditoriums with people from, from uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, politicians that would come in here. I mean, it was a big thing. A bunch of folks from the, from the newspaper uh, put on this show every year. This is kind of like the local version of the Capitol Steps. That's is very that... much like that. Okay. Yeah, it was musical, and, and Burlow Swanger and I would put together uh, musical numbers and the like and, and, and really spoofy things uh, for, uh, for people's consumption. And did that for eight years. Uh, and so my image was out there a little bit, made the newspaper a lot with uh, you know, many of those sketches and the like. Uh, not too long ago, Jim jumped at the chance to relive those exciting days by helping out the Memphis Bar Association with their satirical review, Entertaining Motions, a benefit to raise money for local organizations that provide legal help and advice for low-income people. He got to know a kindred spirit in lawyer and improv comic Joe Labovich. A lot of attorneys really do enjoy getting on stage, they enjoy writing, they enjoy performing. And somebody like Jim was really able to bring a special energy to that to make it more entertaining and more fun and just a better experience for everybody involved. It was Jim's reputation as a polished performer for benefit events that won him a fateful invitation. So I got a call from uh, WKNO asking me if I would consider hosting their first pledge night. They said, we're going to have to raise money. They're threatening to take away public broadcasting's money. Congress is, and we've got to do something about it. So we're going to have a pledge night. We're going to do a delayed broadcast of a University of Memphis basketball game. Oh, wow. And I said, well, that should be uh, certainly appealing. And I said, what do I do? And I said, you just go on the air and you ask for money. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to <laughs> ask for money. I said, Wow, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And the next thing I knew, it was like, well, next Tuesday we're gonna do this again. Jim, can you possibly? <laughs> and, and I fell in love with WKNO at that time, and they yeah. kept calling me. Jim always told how he was one of the first ones to do a pledge drive. And of course, he was, and of course, for many years after that, Jim did pledge drives for WKNO. Charles, Jim doesn't say one of the first. He says the first, <laughs> the first. Jim always says that. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Eichner didn't change direction right away, far from it, but television was calling. And when Jim was ready for a career change, WKNO and Memphis welcomed him with open arms. It was in 1987 that Jim came to work for WKNO Television and Radio as our marketing manager to help sell program sponsorships. And it was from that point forward that Jim became so involved in the station. Thanks for investing in quality television for the Mid-South and thanks for your continued financial support. My reaction was probably like so many other people that, hey, I know that guy. I know that voice. Hey, there's Jim. And then I kept thought, of course, that's, that's what he really, that, that, that's his calling. Beggar of money. It's called solicitor of financial buoyancy. I had just been hired to come to uh, WKNO. And so this was about 30 days in advance of my actually fulfilling the position. And I came and they were doing a pledge drive. <laughs> and I met Jim Eichner. When I first started doing TV Pledge, Jim Eichner gave me some very important advice. That even though you're talking to a camera and you think there are thousands of people watching, you really are only talking to one or two people watching at home in their living room. Ah, so true, Sally. That's why people make these British comedies part of their regular television diet. He had his, his, you know, jacket on, his tweed coat or whatever, and I just looked at him and I said, you know, you are just the Rex Harrison of public broadcasting. Jim was funny both on camera and off. Meet your new weekly, and you're in. We'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> what I think Joe means to say is, we're close to the end of tonight's presentation, so we hope you'll come on board and become a member of WKNO. 
I look to him to learn how to speak on camera. David. It's Harold. No, no, it's David. No, no, it's Harold. Are you sure? Well, I'm, I'm mostly sure. I, I could call around and check if you'd like. I'm very comfortable with that now, so I probably owe that to him. Well, of course, the popularity of Antiques Roadshow is absolutely phenomenal. Unexcelled it's great to watch a master at work, but a man's life is not summed up by his career. While Jim did work hard at his jobs, he also worked hard to make Memphis, to make the world a better place. Jim was used any number of times, any number of ways to speak to classes, to teach courses, and to give tours of this incredible cathedral. He did that, oh, about four or five times a year. And you can imagine there was a great theatrical presence about him when he did that. He took great pride in this cathedral and the art and the beauty of it as well. Jim was a true mentor to a number of young people in our congregation. There's one who went through confirmation class, that's when they're ninth grade, ninth grade, and Jim was indeed a mentor. And now that young man is a junior at Rhodes majoring in theater and drama. We talked for a while and he offered to give me a, a tour and I accepted him on it because I love anything doing like TV, radio, or movies. And so in the tour and he told me all these amazing stories. There's just a goodness about the man, just a fundamental goodness about him that came through. And maybe that was part of how uh, he communicated so effectively, not just his, uh, his demeanor and his wonderful, distinctive voice, but just uh, the general goodness of the man came through and uh, his, uh, his character uh, was, was self-evident. I have to admit, he was probably the reason I got accepted in the roads. We at WKNO share our sense of loss with the community of Idlewild Presbyterian Church, which has lost a leading member, and also with the Rotary Club of Memphis, which has lost its sitting president. I do want to say I'm the president of the Rotary Club, and I just returned from Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I learned what Rotary is doing internationally, and that outfit is just really remarkable. We have, we have packed and, and prepared over a quarter of a million meals in Memphis for hunger to feed international hunger and local hunger with the food bank, and uh, to, to have been chosen as the president of that outfit is, is just a, a shining moment. He was a servant leader, and Jim implored us as a Rotary Club to um, serve the community that we live in. Within a four seconds after we met, he told me he worked with WKNO, and within a week, we were playing golf together. But I always appreciated his enthusiasm, and, and the way he made everyone feel better by the association with him. Jim was my buddy and we'll miss him. The Jim Eichner that I knew at the Rotary Club was the same Jim Eichner that you'd see at the golf course, was the same Jim Eichner that you'd see on the stage, whether it be at a playhouse or theater Memphis or wherever in the community. This was a genuine, authentic, very much of a loving guy who really wanted to take all his talents and put them on display. At an age when most people begin to show signs of slowing down their pace, Jim was stepping his up. He was doing plays and, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, in fact, we all, he's, he's just a role model for all of us. Well, he didn't like to be still. I mean, he was always going. Yeah. Sometimes it seemed like he was on stage everywhere, from Theater Memphis to the Tennessee Shakespeare Company to Playhouse on the Square. He loves to act. He loves to be on stage. He brings stature. He brings grace. Uh, that wonderful voice of his, it's uh, warm and takes charge, too. <laughs> you, you really are the sweetest man in the world, and I'm the only one who knows. <laughs> hey, you clown! Put the knife down! You could see Jim Eichner in independent no. films, such as Mark Jones's Fraternity Massacre no. at Hell Island. 
Well, well, let's just see who this killer clown really is. <gasps> dean Jones? Who? Well, it's the college dean. I did it for you. What? More recently, Jim had some fun with guest appearances on Professor Gould's Horror School. Just get out there and tell some jokes for Pete's sake. Well, I've already got the script Now written. listen, do you understand English? I said no. You find something funny, ghoul, or you are dead. Outgrown Santa Claus? What nonsense! Bring me the child! Not a child, exactly. More of a cat puppet. Ah, oh, my little friend Shotzi! Hi, Jim Eichner! I'll never go back! You can't make me. What, what the, the what? what? Jim Eichner is your father? You blithering idiot. We are a vastly superior class of being whose actual dimensions your puny mind is unable to comprehend. Although I guess your Jim Eichner must be a pretty dashing fellow. Jim Eichner gave freely of his time to so many, but the people closest to his heart were, and I know remained, his family his late wife, Margaret Ann, his son and daughters, and five grandchildren, who, as long as they stay in Memphis, are going to spend many, many years hearing the phrase, I knew your grandfather. I married Margaret Ann Fagan from Macomb, Mississippi, whom I met at Southwestern. Lost her a few years ago. Uh, my son is the Dean of Academics at uh, Memphis University School, Philip Eichner. Uh, my daughter, Mari, was with WREG, uh, same marketing manager there for a good number of years, and now she's working with St. Jude and putting on a lot of their special events. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, Maggie, is with one of the uh, uh, advertising agencies here. She does a great job of copy reading, and uh, she uh, uh, also is a talented singer. She was a, a voice and piano major at Southwestern. At Rhodes, and uh, she is uh, leading the singing now for some of the services at Lindenwood Christian Church. And uh, her three children have done wonderfully well at, at Hutchison and uh, at Memphis University School. And uh, um, my my son's children, uh, daughter and and uh, son, are also doing very well academically. And uh, my one grandson, oldest grandson just uh, got a full scholarship to Rhodes College for pre-med, so uh, everything's going pretty well. But Jim would frequently wear suits to school because he was always making a speech for the Optimist Club or for one of the Rotary Club or one of the uh, outstanding civic organizations in Memphis. So uh, one day, all of the boys in the school decided they were gonna have Jim Eichner Day, and so for Jim Eichner Day, all the boys wore a suit to school. Our club just put on their bow ties and uh, many wore seersucker to honor him. And I don't know of anybody else who would get this kind of a tribute. But yes, this is a brand new suit. This is not my style, but um, this was Jim's. For Jim Eichner, life was a time for learning. This is how he put it, talking to Chris Hardaway just a couple of years ago. I have a little mantra that I repeat most mornings uh, that uh, is, is a, uh, an acronym, GLAD. Uh, to wake up grateful, uh, to find some way that day to, to love, to show love, to treat life like an adventure, the G-L-A-D, and the, the fourth is the most difficult for me, and that's discipline. You do all this, but you've got to have some discipline with it. And this motivates me and keeps me going, and it's exciting to say there is no acceptable alternative to viewing this day as an adventure. Jim's life was an adventure, and we were lucky to share the path with him for a while. And it's hard to imagine anyone putting more in or getting more out of life than our friend Jim Eichner. I'm Tom Prestigiacomo for WKNO. Thanks for remembering with me.
Jim had a lot of jokes, told a lot of jokes to anyone who would listen. You're not a piece of rope, are you? I'm afraid not. Why does a chicken coop have two doors? And guy gets out and says, I'm an agent with federal government. We need to inspect your fields for illegal drugs. And the rancher says, okay, fine, but don't go in that field over there. And so the DEA agent gets all upset and pulls out his badge and shows it and said, you see this badge, old man? This means I can go anywhere I want, anytime I want. I'm sorry to tell you I've run over your cat, but I'd be happy to replace it. That's very kind of you, but are you any good at catching mice? A couple minutes later, uh, he hears screaming coming from his pasture. And the, uh, uh, he looks over there and the, the agent is running for his life, followed by the biggest, meanest bull that you've ever seen. And the farmer drops his tools and runs over to the fence and says, show him your badge. Why does a chicken coop have two doors? What's green and sits around the backyard? Patty or furniture. You went to St. Bridget's School, I went to St. Bridget's School. It's going to be a very long night. The O'Malley twins are already drunk. If you jump out that window, the wind will bring you right back up. Seriously, you jump out that window and the wind brings you right back up. And the guy stands up, jumps out the window. And of course he plummets to his death. The bartender leans over and says, Superman, you're one mean drunk. Why does a chicken coop have two doors? Because if it had four doors, it would be a chicken sedan. Lent? Well, who to and for how long? He, she's like, don't be a schmuck. Go down there and give the guy a push. I know this one. Is it, they needed uh, a push on the swing. Has somebody done the chicken coop joke yet?